Hold on, I gotta get my door in place. Amen. Good morning, everybody. We are so glad you are here this morning. Welcome to our South Campus and everyone who is watching online. We're so glad you guys chose to come and worship and celebrate with us. I can only imagine is a beautiful, beautiful song. And how many of you have seen the movie that has just recently come out, busting all kinds of records because Hollywood needs to learn that we Christians go to movies too, <laughs> right? And so I encourage you, if you haven't seen that movie, to go see it. And, and, and we're talking about the afterlife, and today we're talking about death uncovered in part two. What does that look like? What does that mean? And, and, and just trying to dispel some of the mysteries about death and maybe take some of the, the fear away. Before we, before we get into that specifically, though, I was doing some internet research, and, and I, I think I stand corrected because... From what I can tell, you can take it with you. I didn't know that, but, and I guess it's all depending on the size of your faith, how big of trailer you actually rent and how much stuff you really wanna take with you. Um, you know, or if you just opt to go with the Hearst U-Haul truck option, you can do that also. So just make your funeral arrangements with U-Haul uh, as you plan and prepare for the rest of your departure. If you're new to Rock, welcome home. We are, this is just the way we roll here, all right? Today we want to talk about death, and, and uh, in the Bible it talks about two kinds of faith, basically. One is what we would call transcending faith, that faith that is, we believe in Jesus, we believe we're going to hell, we believe there is life after, and then there is what we would term that victorious faith, that faith that we are overcomers in this life and that we stand in faith and on the promises of God's word for here on earth. Here's what I can tell you though. Two thirds of the, the references within the Bible, we kind of tend as, as believers, we kind of tend to focus on we are overcomer. We talk about that faith a lot. But two thirds of the references to faith in the Bible are talking about our transcending faith. The faith that takes us from this life to the next. The faith that sustains us when we, when we have questions and, and we ask the questions why and, and we're puzzled and, and we don't totally understand. So today we wanna, we wanna build your transcending faith. We wanna help you grow and, and learn and understand in that. If you're taking notes this morning, our first big thought is this, is that we all are appointed to die. We are all going to face death at one time at one point or another. Now, I'm still holding out that maybe Jesus will return in my lifetime, that I'm planning on living another 40, 50 years, uh, and, 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 and I'm, maybe, maybe we will hear the trumpet sound and the blink and the twinkling of an eye, he will return. There won't be time to say, Jesus, save me. I mean like, boom, like lightning, he has come and all the believers are removed. Now that movie, uh, Left Behind, here's where I disagree with them. I am going to heaven clothed. I am not streaking to heaven. I don't know, I'm just, that's my opinion. I don't have a scriptural backup, but I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm just, let me go to heaven and I'll go to good heaven and I'll turn in the clothes there and then I'll get my new heavenly robes and garments and all that stuff. If you haven't seen the movie, when they are left behind, they leave all their clothes. But accordingly, it's just pants and shirts because I didn't see any underwear left behind. So <laughs> whatever their theology is, you get to keep some. <laughs> Look what the scripture teaches us in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, it says, as just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. So, Christ, so also Christ was offered once and for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. And he will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation, redemption, to, to save us, deliver us from this world to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, when I was a teenager, one of the reasons I didn't want Jesus to come back is because I was a virgin. 
And, and I was like, dear God, don't come back now. Wait till I get married. Then you can come back because I didn't want to be trapped in eternity as a virgin. <laughs> it was just how my high school brain worked at the moment. <laughs> we got to live as though Jesus may come back tomorrow and we have to live as though Jesus might not come back for 25 years. But we eagerly wait and anticipate for him and his return. Now, if I can, if I can identify it and help you understand, death is as simple as a doorway. It's, it's, if this was the front door to my house, I'm outside and I step inside. If you can't see me, watch the screens. I step, there we go, I, I step inside and I, I, I'm, I'm outside, I'm inside. I'm in this earth, and I live here in this planet, and I step into eternity. Eternity in heaven or eternity in hell? Our choices on this side of the door determine what's on the other side of this door. We can't, we have to decide here what's going to happen and we have to have our faith in Christ or our rejection of Christ happens over here and that determines, you know, remember uh, uh, what's behind curtain number one? Well, if you have faith in Jesus, you know that when you pass, when you open this door, there is heaven waiting for you. And you know, I'm telling you, you're, you'll hear my voice, whether it's a decade from now, whenever it is, and all of a sudden you're passing and you open the door and it's like, whoa, it's hot. There, yeah, you're going. <laughs> and you're getting what's there. There's no opportunity to change your mind once that door opens and you're going through. Our decisions and our faith or our rejection of our faith determines our future. Number two, death is victory for the believer. Can I get an amen? amen. Death is victory. It's not defeat. And here's guilty myself. How many of us have had a loved one, a friend, a church, church member, we've had someone die and we feel like it is a defeat? Oh no, they lost. <laughs> Ask the people who were in heaven. They, are, they didn't lose. They wouldn't trade places with you or I if they had the option. Look how Revelations chapter 21 describes it. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. And I love verse four. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death and, or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. No more depression, no more worry and anxiety, no more heaviness and frustration and just frustration in life. And just, no more of that. Sorrow is gone, weeping is gone. No more pain in this body, no more achy joints, no more sickness, no more disease, but to live in absolute freedom and absolute victory with God. In Acts chapter 14, Paul is preaching in Lystra. And in, in, in Lystra, Paul gets stoned. Now, not Colorado stoned. <laughs> I heard some of your brains going, really? I didn't know that. No, no, it's not scriptural that I can identify. Paul gets stoned. And what would happen is he was persecuted for preaching Jesus. And so they would hold him down and men would take large... I mean, if you're just throwing stones, that's, it might nick me, might cut me, it's not going to kill me. They're taking small boulders and splat and breaking ribs and, and, you know, and people are always gonna go for the head. If you get in a fight, they're always, and so people are, are stoning him, pelting him with large rocks and small boulders. And it says that they drug him out of the town because they supposed him to be dead. And it tells us that his disciples, his ministry team, stood around him and he, he got up. Now, if, I, if that just happened to me, I'm going to tell you where my faith's at. 
I'm not going back into Lystra. I'm going to Pueblo. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going back to the place where they just beat the fire out of me. Paul gets up and he goes, Jason, I'm back. <laughs> I've returned. But in his letter to the Corinthian church, he recounts that experience from 14 years ago. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 12. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. I do not know. You see, if you've read or heard testimonies of people that are, are passing from, from this life to the next, sometimes they've, 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 uh, uh, they'll see themselves leaving their body at the car accident, and they're above the car accident scene, and they're about to go to the door, and then they're sucked back into their body. Paul had a heavenly encounter. Look what he said. He said, I was caught up to paradise. He said, and I heard things so astounding that they can't be expressed in words and things no human is allowed to tell here on this earth. I can't tell you what I heard. It was freaking awesome. <laughs> Dean's Amplified version. <laughs> it is inexpressible. I can't put into human words the joy, the glory, the goodness that I saw and I experienced. That's what heaven is. Heaven is victory. Death is victory for the believer. There was a painting done that one of the members shared with me a couple weeks ago as they knew this series was coming up, and it is a beautiful painting. It's called First Day in Heaven. Check that out. Ah, I can only imagine. I can only imagine to hug him, to have him wrap his arms around me. I can only imagine what it must be like to see my Lord and Savior Jesus face to face, to look into his eyes. I can only imagine to feel his love firsthand, to, to feel his grasp around me. I can only imagine. Heaven is not to be feared. Heaven is victory for us. Two years ago, approximately two and a half years ago, somewhere in that time frame, some of you might remember hearing it on the news. Um, at Andrew Wavmack Ministries, I teach in uh, his Bible school as an adjunct professor at Karis Bible College. Well, they used to have the school here, and he has a facility here, and they had since moved up the mountain, and, but they were redoing the roof on the building at Andrew Womack Ministries. They'd hired a company out of Tulsa to come and do the, the major repairs. And it was a family business because it was, it was the grandfather, the father, and the son. There were three generations of this family of roofers who were working on the building. I don't know what happened other than they were removing some sections of the roof and replacing sections, and the 21-year-old son mistakenly stepped backwards into one of the openings and fell 30-some feet to the floor in the auditorium that they had there at the ministry. And so I don't remember if anyone was in the room, but within, within seconds, minutes, somebody knew that something had happened, and you know they had yelled and saw him fall, and Within just a brief amount of time, one of the security officers from Andrew Womack Ministries was there, and he was, has served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and so he's seen trauma and, and so forth. And so he's there. He's a believer, obviously. Joe, who fell, was a believer. And he immediately, he checks for a pulse, and there is none, and they're calling 911, and, and, and uh, the, several have gathered, and they're speaking life Life over Joe, life over Joe, in the name of Jesus, life. And supposedly from what I have learned, he, he momentarily opened his eyes, and then they lost him again. And they were speaking life into him. And they lost him, and the paramedics came, and they could never resuscitate him. And regrettably, a 21-year-old died. Well, I had heard about it, that the accident had happened, but later that day... I get a call from my pastor, Pastor Hagen in Tulsa. 
He says, Dean, did you hear about the accident? He said, there are members here in the church where I'd been youth pastor. And I, I didn't know the family, but they knew me. He said, Dean, I can't get there. Would you go and minister to the family? He said, they want to raise Joe up. Well, wait a second. On my bucket list. As Jesus said, the works that we do, shall, that he did, shall we do also. And, and, and we see that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and raised, raised a little girl from the dead. And we see that, I start reading the book of Acts when Paul was preaching, long-winded till midnight, and Eutychus was sitting in the window on the third floor, and he got so bored with Paul's preaching <laughs> that he went to sleep, and when he goes to sleep, he falls out of the window and dies. And Paul goes to him and lays across him, and life comes back. And they get him up, they give him some food, and of course, Paul went back to preaching. <laughs> Just don't let Eutychus sit in the window. <laughs> so I had scriptural foundation. So when I go and I meet with the mother and the father and the grandparents, and I, and I go meet with them, it's not, it's not, it's not, oh, this is... I walk in, they're like, hey, Pastor Dean, good to see you. Joe's coming home. Joe's coming back. And their faith was in it to win it. We are going to raise Joe up. And then I saw their faith and I said, I'm in it. I, I have wanted to see this. I am ready. Here is a... Tw 21 year old he has a destiny he has a plan he has a purpose there is there is a destiny for him the coroner wouldn't let us get to see him so we had to wait till the autopsy was done it was about two and a half days later until the funeral home gets the body and i called the funeral home and he's a friend and i said paul we need 30 minutes don't do anything to joe's body and so they had Joe's body, he was in the, we didn't see his body, but he was in the body bag and they'd put one of their official claws over. So we walk into the viewing room and there you just see the form of a man in the shape of a man. And so we had, we had prayed and, and I'm praying and the family's gathered, so their family and some close friends and I mean like, we are going in to win. And I'm reading scripture and I said, we just need 30 minutes. So we get in the room, we gather around, and, and we just start praying, praying in the Spirit, just starting to, to pray. And then we begin to use the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, and we begin to speak life into Joe's body, and to call his spirit back, and to call him into his body. And within five minutes of praying, within minutes of praying, like a broken record going off on the inside of me, and I tried to turn it off, I tried to turn it off, and on the inside of me, I heard his will, 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 his will. Shh. We're trying to raise him from the dead. Be quiet. Speak life in Jesus' name. His will, his will, his will, his will. After about 20 minutes, I, I gathered the family and I said, I said, guys, let's just huddle up here. I said, Here's what I keep hearing in my heart. And I shared what I heard. One or two others said, got this ghost-eyed look, and they said, I've had the same thing. I've had that same sensation. Here's what I shared. I said, no more than God will override our will today and make us love Jesus. He's not going to override Joe's will in our worldly time standards, there is no time in heaven, but in our time standards, he's been in heaven for two and a half days. This is Joe hugging Jesus. I told my son about it, and my son was, was about 21, 22, Joe's same age, and I called my son, and I was telling him, he said, what'd you do today? I said, tried to raise a dead person back to life. <laughs> just a normal day, just a pastor. <laughs> And my own son said to me, Dad, don't you dare try and bring me back. If I have seen the glories and the wonders of heaven, if I have walked and talked with Jesus, I'm not coming back, Dad. <laughs> well, thanks, son. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the reality. Death stings and death hurts for those of us 
that are left. On your notes, grief is the price for those who remain. Grief is the price for those who remain. If we didn't love, it wouldn't hurt. If we didn't care, it wouldn't matter. But grief is the price of love. And it stings, and it hurts, and it's sad. And I'm never going to fault a loved one, a church member, a friend who chooses not to come back because you or I wouldn't come back. And Joe chose not to come back. It wasn't because he doesn't love his family. It's because he loves Jesus more than his family. And I'm never going to be disappointed with any of my family or friends that say, I love you, Dean. I love you, Dad. But I love Jesus more. That's going to put a grin on my face. That's going to bring, bring contentment to my heart. And so I'm convinced of this. Several things to, why don't we see more dead race to, brought back to life? Several reasons. Number one, I think we need to be on the scene. And when it happened, you say, well, there were believers there. Well, here's what has to be happening the moment you bring someone, you try and raise somebody from the dead. If Bob dies of a heart attack, the big one's coming, you know, and he, and he drops over and, and he's not breathing. And we say, Bob, in Jesus' name, you get back in your body. You come back into this house. I speak life over you. And all of a sudden, Bob's like, the big one's coming. Oh. Unless he gets healed of the very thing that killed him, he'll continue to die again. So we've got to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation, the working, the miracles, the, the gifts of healings. It's, it's now beyond our, our natural faith that it's got to be a supernatural move, an act of God. It's got to, there's got to be, because otherwise they'll just die again unless they get healed of the thing that killed them. Does that make sense? And so we saw Joe come back to life. <laughs> And it's no discredit to those that were praying, but whatever trauma had taken his life took it again. Once his spirit came back, it took it again. Now, who I think we can bring back days on end, I'd be willing to try weeks on end. He stinketh, as Jesus said by now. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said in John? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. There was grief and there was sorrow there. And, and they... Jesus said, roll the stone away. And they said, Master, you don't know what you're doing. He's been in the grave four days, and you're about to unload some stink like nobody stink. He said, roll the stone away. Here's who I think we do have an opportunity, whose will won't, whose will will actually partner with us, is a person who has died and was a sinner, and the other side of their door was hell. I think they're jumping up and down going, please pray, please bring me back. And their will will agree when we say life in Jesus' name. So there's your little lesson on raising the dead. Just go and do. <laughs> on your notes, in the midst of death, we have to decide, am I going to run away from my faith or run to my faith? When you have questions you don't understand, are you going to get mad and bitter at God, the only one that really can comprehend and understand what you're going through? And let me just tell you this, having been in the ministry and having been around a lot of dead people and been with a lot of families, unless you have experienced death firsthand by someone in your immediate circle, don't ever tell a person, I understand what you're going through. You can say, I'm sorry. You can grieve with them. But see, when we all go back to our normal lives and we go back to our jobs and, and, and the funeral and the memorial has been several weeks away, they're living with the grief of that death and they're carrying that sorrow with them. Even in the midst of their joy, they're still carrying that grief the rest of their life. And God's grace sustains them. But we have to run to our faith. We have to run to our faith when we don't understand. And we say, God, I don't understand, but I come to you and I run to you. Number four, death is simply a change of address. Kim and I moved to Colorado Springs in 2000, summer of 2000. August 1st, 2000, we moved into our home in Monument. 
Our neighbors that we were best friends with, they're coming to see us next week because they believe we still exist. When we move, they go, they're gone. They're gone. They're gone. They didn't stand in front of our house and go, we'll never see you again. No, the hawks moved from a troubled place to a better place. We moved from a state that has 98% humidity and 105 degree temperatures in the summer and mosquitoes fly off with your children. (laughs) We moved to a better place. We changed addresses to a better place. And so we didn't cease to exist, nor do your loved ones cease to exist. It's a change of address. Look what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, therefore, we always are confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. Look what's right here in the middle of this passage. He's talking about our walk with God. And here's a verse we pull out all the time and talk about for victorious faith. And it's really written talking about transcending faith. For we live by faith, not by sight. Because we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. The scripture, I think we can still use it for our overcoming faith, But it's really talking about our transcending faith that we walk by faith. No matter what we see or feel or what it looks like, we know that we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we have that faith and that assurance and that confidence and that trust. Does that make sense? Jesus said in John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. That there's a home in heaven for us. Number five, we all will face judgment. We're all going to face judgment. Now last week we talked about the great white throne and that The first judgment is going to be, is your name in the Lamb's book of life or not? If your name is in the book of life, then yes, you are going into heaven. If your name is not in the book of life, you're going to hell. But for us as believers, we are going to face judgment. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Everything you and I do in our lifetime is being recorded, and it's being tracked. Everything we do. We open the door, doo-doop, reward in heaven. We snarl at our spouse, (laughs) blooper in heaven. And it's all being recorded. And our reward is going to be based upon the things we have done in this life. And so if I can put it this way, Jesus said in Matthew 6, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven. He said, for where your treasure is, the desire of your heart will also be. If you're taking notes, our deeds do not gain us access into heaven, but they determine our rewards in heaven. So your goodness here on earth does pay off. Some of you skipped church last Sunday. (laughs) You came to church today. You get a reward in heaven. You served in the nursery first service. (laughs) Rewards came in. You were rewarded for your good actions. It's not going to get you into heaven, but it's your reward in heaven. And watch what happens. Here's your reward, 1 Corinthians 3. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ, built. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. Gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. Now here's what happens. It goes on in that passage to tell that on judgment day, we come before the throne, all of our actions, good deeds, gold, silver, and jewels, ching, 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 wood, hay, and stubble, boop, 
boop, boop. <laughs> They're backing those trucks up with our wood, hay, and stubble. It says our reward will be revealed by fire. <laughs> what survives? All those things that we're embarrassed about. We're not going to live through eternity with all of those. And no one will know the sins that we've committed and the practices that we had. It'll just appear as wood, hay, and straw. And it'll be destroyed by fire. And what is remaining will be left over. Now for me, I've been working on this for 56 years. I got a shot from heaven. This is my rewards in heaven. They're unloading more right now. Because I was hungry and I was going to Dunkin' Donuts and I stayed for you. And inside each one of these containers is all of that. Now, what I didn't show you is the mountains of wood, hay, and straw <laughs> that will be consumed by fire and reveal my source. Let's wrap this up. Number six, there are some questions that we'll never answer, that we will never answer on this side of heaven. In life after death, there are some things we can't explain and we ask why, and we're frustrated, and we don't understand, and, and there has to be a reason. We have to understand and know why. Can I give you a window into my pastoral world? Many a relatives have passed because it was their will. I remember a family in Tulsa, and I believe it was cancer, was eating the man's body. And the family is believing, standing, praying. He is proclaiming, I'm healed in Jesus' name. I'm going to live and not die. And the family is there, and they're praying, and they're standing on the promises of God's word that are, are good to stand on. One day I made a hospital visit, and it was in the morning before any of the family was there. And I went and I sat down by the bed. And he's laying in the bed, and down the side of his forehead come big tears. He says, Pastor, I hurt. I hurt like I have never hurt. I'm tired of fighting this disease. I am so tired. Pastor, I just want to be with Jesus and out of this misery. Five minutes later, his family walks in. There's the mighty man healed of God. Amen. Amen. That family wonders, how did he die in the midst of standing for healing? Because he raised the white flag and said, death is not defeat. Death is victory for me. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Some things are a secret between your family, your friends, and God, and we may never know. Maybe there was a pastor that knew but many times when someone is in a, in, a, in a desperate state, they're clinging between life and death. I'll gather the family and I'll say, your, your will is keeping them here. They're staying because of you. Go into that room, tell them you love them, and release them and let them know you'll be okay. I would tell you almost every time within the hour the person passes. You gave them permission to go home. Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? For death is swallowed up with victory in Christ Jesus. And there is no defeat. And so we stand and we walk with him and, and we overcome. And our last two thoughts... Sometimes we wrestle too much over why they died rather than rejoicing and where they have gone. Have confidence in that. And lastly, everyone has questions. Don't allow your questions to become bigger than your faith. Would you stand to your feet with me? Keep your faith centered on Jesus Christ. My faith is that Jesus is my healer. 
I don't care that grandma died, that Uncle Joe died. I don't care that my friend died. I still believe the promises of God and that healing is a promise that God has given to me and that I do have authority over sickness and disease in the name of Jesus Christ and I can command it to leave and I can command it to depart and I'll live and I'll not die. I base my faith on the word, not on experience. I base it on the promises of God. I want to close with this and I want you to just listen and possibly maybe just close your eyes. But a number of years ago, a friend of my son at age 15 died of cancer. In the midst of that season, I, I wrote a poem and I found it as I was doing some research for this series. I want to read it to you and I feel like I have the word of God. If heaven could speak, what would heaven say? What would your loved one say? What would your friend say? Hear these words. It's indescribable, unimaginable. Human words cannot express all the wonders that heaven does possess. No more sorrow, no more pain. I simply rest in the power of his name. For me, life has only just begun. Nothing can compare to living in the presence of the sun. It was cool to worship from below, but what a difference to actually stand in his radiant glow. My Jesus, what an amazing guy. His hugs, his love, he's like a well that never runs dry. This place is filled with so much joy in life, not a glimmer of the former earthly strife. I'm sure some of you down under are unsure about all this unseen wonder. All I can say is, if you want to be a part, you'll trust the leading in your heart. I've been to see the Father, and I struggled on His lap, and I snuggled on His lap. He whispered in my ear, before you know it, you'll have your family back. Don't weep. Don't feel sad for me. I'm free. I'm free. I have never been so free. Rest. Rest in the promises of God. Put your faith and your trust in Jesus. We have tears on this earth. The tears in heaven are tears of joy as they fellowship with the Father and snuggle on his lap. A young, gifted art protege named Akiana, Akiane, had a vision when she was eight years old. She was eight years old. This is when she was eight. And she had a vision and Jesus appeared to her and she painted a portrait of Jesus. You've seen it in the book, um, um, what's the, Heaven is, Heaven is for Real. Or maybe you saw the movie, Heaven is for Real. That's the story about a four-year-old that had a, had a life, uh, a heavenly experience and encounter during his surgery. And his dad was a pastor and he began to share the things that he saw when the surgery took place. And his dad would show him pictures and drawings and sketchings of Jesus that had been done over millenniums. He said, Dad, that's not him. That's not him. And one time they were walking past a Christian bookstore and this, go ahead and throw the next picture up there. This picture of Jesus was in the window. And little Colton stopped and he says, Dad, 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 that's him. That's the Jesus I saw. Who knows, we could be looking into the eyes of our loving Savior. And here is my question today. Would you put his picture on the side screens, please? I'd like you to look at one of the pictures of Jesus that you see here in this room. And I ask you this question. 
When you look into his eyes, is there fondness, is there love, is, is, there, is there desire to be with him and you know that you are one with him? Rejoice in that. But if you're here and you're not born again, and you've never invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I dare you to look in his eyes. And I dare you, I dare you to accept his love. And if you say no, I dare you to look in the eyes of this man on the screen and say, I reject you. No, Jesus, I don't want your forgiveness. I reject your love. Nice that you died on a cross and were beaten and scourged and nailed to a tree for my sake, but I refuse and I reject you. I dare you to reject him face to face. Be a man, be a woman about it. If you're going to reject him, say it out loud and say, I reject you, Jesus. Or come to that place, and this is where I want you to come. But you look in his eyes and you say, I'm a sinner. And I'm wrong. And I've tried to do it on my own. I need your love. Jesus, would you accept me? Will you forgive me and let his love change your life for eternity? If you want his love, I'm going to count to three. And if you're not living the way you should, if you're not serving Jesus like you know you should, if you've never said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, when I hit three, I want you to raise your hand high. I don't want you to be wimpy about it, try and sneak it in. We're not going to sneak you into heaven. We're going to walk you in the front door, and we're going to say, come meet Father. Come. I want to introduce you to my Father, and I want to introduce you to His Son, Jesus. Raise it high. Receive His love. One, two, Three, raise that hand really, really high. There's one over there. There's two over there. There's three. Anybody else? Amen. God bless you. Come on, church. Anybody else? Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Now you know. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I hope the Word of God is changing your life and you're being blessed and ministered to by participating in our services and enjoying the sermons that you see here online. If by chance that you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you take a moment right now and repeat this prayer with me and take that leap of faith and put your trust in God. Pray with me now. Dear loving God, Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for my sins. And I invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for saving me and loving me in Jesus' name. And just like that, you're adopted into the family of God. If you live in Colorado Springs or are going to be in the area, we invite you to join us at one of our two campuses. Our Woodman campus is at 4005 Lee Vance Drive. That is at the Woodman and Rangewood intersection. And our South Campus is located at 262 South Academy. Join us at either one of those locations. Check the website for service times. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.